Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers. On each show, we sit down with a Santa Barbara leader who's wrestling with tough issues facing our community to talk about their jobs and their decisions and to invite them to share their deepest and darkest secrets with the promise we won't tell anybody. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts, and our special guest tonight is Helene Schneider, mayor of Santa Barbara and Democratic candidate for the 24th Congressional District seat. And joining me in the conversation, joining us in the conversation, is Josh Molina, politics reporter for NewsHawk. Welcome, and thank both of you for being here. Where were you born? Where? Yeah. Brooklyn, New York. And w when was that? And that was in 1970. You grew up in Brooklyn? I grew up in Manhattan, uh, and, uh, in an area that's very different now than what it was when I was growing up on the Upper West Side. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, grew up there with my mom. My, my parents separated when I was very young. Uh, they still kept connected together. Were they both living in Manhattan? Uh, uh, originally, and then dad moved to Brooklyn Heights, and then he went to Mount Vernon, which is right upstate New York, uh, just a little ways up north of the city. And you have a sister? So I have a very extended family. Uh, I, have, uh, my, I have a stepmother, well, she died a couple of years ago, um, but I have my stepmother, I have a stepfather, they were both married. They had kids from their first marriage, uh, and those kids now have kids, and so it's a very extended family. And I have a half sister. We have the same dad. She's five years younger, and so. Uh, and they're all back east, still. Um, yes, I have a stepbrother who lives in Altadena. And how did you make your way to Santa Barbara? I um, went to school in uh, Skidmore College, upstate New York, and met someone there who got his who got a P, got a PhD offer here, and so I sent said. Sounds good. Santa Barbara sounds like a nice place. It was 1992, and and uh, we moved here, and I stayed ever since. And did you did you go to UCSD? Did you attend? UCSD? I took uh, I took some concurrent enrollment classes, and I took the UCSB Extension Certification in Human Resources Management, and that's my profession in HR management. So uh, that's how I got to become the HR director. Moving into, as people know, I worked for Planned Parenthood for 11 years in the HR department, and and moved up the ranks in that sense um, there. But and first elected? First elected in 2003. I was the City Housing Authority Commissioner before that. And uh, so the City Council seat opened up in 2003, re-elected in 2007, and then the mayor's race was in 2009, and then re-election in 2013. Okay. Yeah. All right, well that brings us up to date. There we go, that was fast. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's you know, you're not very old, so you know, compared to, well, never mind. Uh, let's start with some news. Uh, <laughs> Judge Anderson mm -hmm. um, issued a 76, I think 75, 76 page ruling uh, saying that the uh, EIR for the Highway 101, the Caltrans EIR, is inadequate in, mm -hmm. in many ways and kind of sending them back, which is a huge victory for you. That's a position you've been taking. So do you feel vindicated by that? You know, it, it's unfortunate it got to the point where you know, Anderley had to issue that ruling. I, I, I'm pleased that he agreed with what I thought was, and, and not just me. Well, you took I mean, a lot of heat. For I that. did take a lot of heat in the sense of speaking out on something that, um, you know, really needs to be done right. And, and so, you know, what I think what Judge Anderley did was look at uh, what the county, the city, our planning commission, we're all saying back in 2012 about really needing to analyze the intersections about this freeway project because at the at the end of the day and what I my concern was is that we want to have traffic congestion relief and we need to do it in a way that doesn't then create un, un, uh, terrible impacts elsewhere and Caltrans unfortunately decided not to do the analysis that was required by them from law and and because I think they felt like they would then have to pay for things and really, I think the local taxpayers need to make sure that Caltrans has um, a good project that is funded that you know will end up getting us out of traffic in a way that does not create other major impacts from Santa Barbara all the way through Goleta. Uh, so, so you big, know, big political victory for you. Well, I thank you. I, I mean, in the sense that um, I, mean, I think it was important. Fact, well, right? it was important that you know I I try to do what I can to speak out in for what I think is in the best interest of, of my constituents. And, and this was an issue that I know many uh, planners and the county and the city kept saying for years, saying we need to really look at this in the full picture. And so, um, 
you know, and, and yeah, I got a lot of political heat because it wasn't the, the political expediency thing to do, but um, I hope Caltrans will continue to do the right thing, do the analysis, go through it quickly, and I'm going to do what I can to, A, make sure this happens as fast as possible in terms of what they need to do, but really also try to make sure we get the funding to make yeah. this happen. Well, <coughs> you've been in office uh, 12 years mm -hmm. now, and you're in a congressional race against uh, uh, Salud Carbajal, who um, is on the other side of the issue uh, on, on this Caltrans uh, ruling. What you call the expedient side, I think, <laughs> just now. Uh, but so sort of like looking at the, uh, the race, uh, how do you think this ruling affects perhaps the way people are looking at who to get behind in this congressional race? Well, I think when you look at, at my candidacy and what I've been saying, um, why I'm interested in running is that, you know, I want to take what I think is pe what people care about in the 24th Congressional District and, and bring that message forward to D.C. And not only to just be a vote on certain issues, but to really raise the issues and try to move a conversation forward and to speak out on something that is what I believe to be in the best interest uh, after listening to all my constituents in their best interest and not necessarily in the political establishment's best interest. And um, sometimes you take heat for that. And sometimes you have to really say, you know, this certain policies need to push forward a little more or, um, you know, in a way that is not uh, in the detriment to our local taxpayers. Um, you know, this project in particular, we're already spending two thirds of this project is already being paid for by local funds. And there, and it was an inadequate analysis for other things that may also require funds to, to mitigate. And we wouldn't have the funds to correct those items um, if Caltrans had to go through the, you know, the project the way they, they pushed it through. So, so you know, I'm trying to do what I can to get the issue resolved um, and also call out when there are problems. And uh, I hope that we can, you know, make, make, make this work. Um, we had Salute on a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him this question, the same question. Is it, you know, in my experience, there's two kinds of me House members, you, people who do try to highlight and raise specific issues and those who really focus more on constituent services and what's going on. Which one are you? I don't think it's an either or, to tell you the truth. And I know you say, which one is it, and pick one. But I, I think... There are certain conversations you need to push on a national level. There are things that are happening here in the state that I think are working extremely well. Um, pay equity issues that our own state senator, Hannah Beth Jackson, authored that's now into law. You know, that needs to be more of a national conversation. Issues related to SB 350, which is talking about energy conservation and, and um, in both a, uh, environmental and economic strength and, and move that forward. At the same time, what I've found as mayor is that there's so much bureaucracy that goes on in DC on issues that local communities and local government cares about. You want someone in office who knows how to go through the morass of the red tape and be able to help uh, local constituencies, local government uh, get through whatever project it is that they need to. I can give one example. Uh, the city, we recommissioned our hydroelectric plant at Cater Water Treatment Facility and uh, it was on federal land. And the, the bureaucracy of keeping on federal land cost more than the electricity it was going to produce, the value of the electricity. So we needed to make it onto city land. The process of um, you know, moving it from federal piece of property to city was onerous and it was expensive. And you, needed some, you need allies in D.C. to help you go through that process. This past year, we, we recommissioned it. When it does rain, and it will again, you know, the water going through Gibraltar Tunnel is going to create enough electricity going through this hydroelectric plant, that uh, equivalent of 200 homes. Did you get that federal help that you needed? Did Lois Capps help you with that? She helped to some, ca to some capacity. Um, you know, I think it was a lot, but it wasn't necessarily what happened on the Hill. It's hap it, what happens in the Bureau of Land Reclamation and the GAO's office and in the budget process. And you want to make sure that either the member of, of the House or their staff or combination is helping your city leaders in, in going through this instead of just paying a lot of lobbyists to do things. Um, I want to do that throughout the 24th okay. Congressional District, and that's a huge, huge part, not just for government, but for the vet that needs vet, veterans assistance or, you know, someone who has um, difficulty getting their, their disability payments or something like that. You know, I've, I've covered you since 2003 when you ran for office, and I've always been impressed with how knowledgeable you are and detailed on the issues, specifics, um, always having a specific answer and the background and the context. 
on a lot of the, this really complicated stuff, and I think it's made you a, a, a good council member and, and mayor, uh, which is, you know, leads into sort of my question, which is, um, this is kind of a, a, a new era for you because for so many years you were you were the rising star. You were, you know, when you got elected council, everybody said you're going to be the next mayor, right? And, and that happened. Um, and then they said, oh, what are you going to do after this? And you had this incredible base behind you. The, we're talking about uh, feminists, progressives, uh, dem elected officials, uh, all behind you. And uh, you know, Das Williams at the time was like the iffy guy, right? What's going to happen with him? But Helene was the one who was going to go for. And uh, we don't know what's, what's ahead. But what we do know is that a lot of these people who backed you and endorsed you who were your allies have really, they've turned on you. They, they are aligning themselves with Salud Carbajal in this race. And it's gotten kind of ugly, certainly over the, the, the Caltrans 101 issue. Uh, and I'm just interested in, in knowing, as honestly as you can talk about it, uh, what, what's, what hap why have so many people who have supported you in the past decided we don't, we don't back her anymore, and we're, we're not going to support her anymore, and we're going to work to have Salud beat her in this congressional race. Um, as honestly as you can, why is that happening? You know, I actually do have quite a bit of support, and and in, I am very um, honored and pleased to have a, a wide range of support throughout the district. I, I don't see it as um, that I people are turning, or they have to make a big decision. This seat is the first time it's been open really in 20 years. If you look at Walter Capps when he ran and won in 1996, um, and then you know he, had, he died and then Lois took on from 1998 moving forward. It's the first time people really get to see who they, who they would like to see to be their next representative. And um, you know, if you remember, Walter at the time when he ran didn't have the establishment uh, backing him. He he was not the guy. He wasn't um, you know the the heir apparent. Um, Marty Stone was, if you remember that name. But Walter has uh, Walter had what I think I had I have, which is just broad range of general good people who are voters, who are leaders in the community, who want to see this kind of new representation uh, moving forward. I, and, and I don't and, doubt that, but certainly if you were plotting, like what's the best way to get endorsed, uh, best way to get elected, the, the path that you're on, the route that you're gonna take is, the, it's an uphill battle. You got Bendy White who's endorsing you on the council. You know, uh, Former mayor is not endorsing you. Uh, Supervisors um, are, are endorsing Salud Carbajal, are the ones who ha yeah. are endorsing. Uh, Hannah Beth is backing you. So I guess what I'm trying to get you as much as possible to, we know you have a lot of support. We know that that uh, it's not a walk away for, for Salud, but if you look at funding, what what happened? You know, what is the issue that has caused so many people? I don't, I don't know, I, you know, I can tell you this, we, and I think it's been out there in, in the past, there, there was a poll done in the, in the summer. Celinda Lake is a very well-known, well-respected pollster who did the thing. Who so did maybe the it's just the, the politics, and, um, and, and not I think, the people. And you've got to look at the full district, too. And what the likely Democratic, not just the Democratic, the likely primary voter said was that I'm in the top two. And in fact, um, what people don't want is an establishment ca candidate. Uh, you know. Salud Carvajal um, has, it's been no secret that he was planning to run for the seat for a very long time. Um, I wasn't planning to run for the seat for a very long time. I made that decision, you know, much, much later. And um, so he obviously had whatever situation he had in terms of talking to people. And that's, that's fine, that's politics. Uh, I, think, I think moving forward, when, to get back to the poll, what, they, what, the likely Democrat, what the likely primary voters are saying is, you know, being a mayor is, makes, is important. Working with people across the aisle is extremely important. Getting things done, dealing with the gridlock, not being the establishment candidate, that's who we want. And so when it comes to the voters of the 24th Congressional District, people are looking to me by eight points. 
And so that that's significant. Have you done another poll since that? That's, that was quite a while ago, right? Yeah, it was quite a while ago. But I think the message um, resonates. And I think even after, uh, you know, we, we ran through the, na the names twice and, and did positive comments on all the candidates, uh, including that uh, Mr. Carbajal was, was endorsed by the incumbent. And actually, my gap uh, widened in, after that. So, yeah. you know, so I think. If you can get into the nitty gritty of people who follow politics, okay, and there's a what we thought people would do, uh, you know, I'm what I what I what I can say is what everyone is saying is, whoever is the Democrat who comes out of this primary, we're going to get behind because the seat's important. And frankly, I believe I'm the better candidate in the Democratic side in this district to actually win in the general election. Let me first of all, I just want to. No, that your, your pollster wouldn't give me the questions that were actually asked, but that's so I, you know, I, I'm always leery of campaign polls, but that, in, unless I see what the thing is. But anyway, that, you're paying them, so I suppose that's why, <laughs> that's why you wouldn't do that. But you let should, me, so, yeah, well. let me ask Josh's question a different way. Uh, you, you know, you've really, you've emphasized you're, you're the only woman in the race. This is a seat that's been held, as you point out, by a woman for, what, 17, 18, 19 years, uh, which is important to Democrats. But yet, uh, both the Women's Political Committee and the Santa Barbara Democratic Women's Club, one has gone neutral and the other has endorsed salute. Why, why is that? I mean, it just it seems very counterintuitive to me that that, that would happen. You know, I I also have the endorsement of a lot of the people involved in both of those organizations, past presidents of both organizations, members of those organizations. Um, you know, a small group of, of uh, it's a high bar to, to get the endorsement of the Women's Political Committee. I know uh, that process. It takes a two-thirds vote, and no one got that two-thirds vote. Uh, you know, and I think they're looking at this race um, very, very carefully. And, uh, you know, and, and so, I, at the same time, a lot of the people in that room have signed up to support me. Same with the Dem women. The Dem women vote came down to one vote. Uh, so that, you know, so, and I think it just goes again to show this is a competitive race. What I would like to see in order for the voters to really see what is the big deal here and what is what matters is let's have forums, let's have debates, let's talk about what the issues are and let people decide for themselves. If um, you know, I think that I think we owe it to the voters to do that. Again, it's been 20 years since there's been an open seat. We're in an open primary. Uh, you know, it it it's. Um, I think people are very engaged in the 24th congressional district, and they want to know where people stand on the issues. And I think um, they deserve to hear and, from us. And for the record, we should note that you agreed bef before we came on the air that you would come on uh, TVSB. You come on Newsmakers with the other candidates and 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 have a little debate here. So thank you. Yeah. that and I guess there's a couple other debates in the works as well but no, no, nothing really final there there's um, there, I think there's something up in Cal Poly in, in February I know there's some members of the Democratic Service Club that like to put on a forum they're trying to work on the date there um, before you know the party might take a position they may they may or may not and uh, so I Kudos to them for saying, let's talk about the issues. Um, I'm not sure everyone's on board with that. I know I am. Uh, so I hope that happens in January. And, uh, you know, maybe you want to moderate it. I don't know. I don't I'm, think they figured I'm, that part I'm, out yet. I'd be delighted. Uh, <laughs> do you expect to be supported by EMILY's List, the, the national uh, fundraising organization that, that raises money for women? We are in uh, constant communication. They are very seriously looking at this race. Um, I, I talk to them frequently, and you know they're just now getting into the open seats, and they've only done a handful of, of endorsements throughout the country for open seats. So, um, I you know we have a good conversation. They're they're keeping track of things. They seem very impressed so far, and and I certainly hope I can earn their endorsement. And um, they they have their own timeline. So I'm you know it's not up to me about what their timeline yeah. is. They're focused a lot right now, frankly, on their biggest thing, obviously, is the President of the United States and Hillary Clinton and um, also the Senate because they think that, you know, the Democrats can take back the Senate. And so the House stuff has sort of taken more of a um, not as, as urgent as the others. Let me, let me ask you a couple of national issue questions and then Josh has some more city stuff. There, there's an interesting debate going on among Republicans now between in, in the wake of the uh, attacks in Paris and, and in San Bernardino uh, between privacy and security. Should the NSA be 
collecting more data. Mm -hmm. the, the, as you know, the legislation um, last year sort of reduced the amount that, that the government was able to get. Where, where are you on that whole spectrum? I, I did think the NSA went a bit overboard. Um, I think privacy is very is crucial. Um, we obviously need information to keep our, us safe, but we don't want to lose our liberty and what keeps us as Americans uh, on, on top of that. Um, you know, the, the issue, and you mentioned San Bernardino, and I know the big conversation happening uh, dealing with gun violence prevention is the, you know, no fly, no buy, as they're calling it. If you're on the no fly list, then you shouldn't just be able to purchase a, um, a weapon, a, a firearm. Um, I'm supportive of that. So there are things that I think we can do that maybe it, that little piece in and of itself won't solve all the problems, but, um, but you really have to balance out. If we get into uh, the government being able to look at everyone's private records without them knowing, I think that really undermines the democracy so that if we you, have. So if you were in the House, you would oppose efforts to kind of reopen that whole issue and, and return to the NSA the broader, the broader powers that it had about the metadata. I, I, I want to be very careful about how much information the NSA has, and, and I think they went overboard in, in some capacity in terms of being able to access people's private data. Can you tell us one or two areas where you would be different than Lois Capps uh, in, in terms of issues in the House? Um, I think my approach would be different. Um, being a mayor, uh, you know, having that perspective of local government is, is very different. Having a perspective of dealing with the drought as we have and having that uh, focus on infrastructure. Uh, I certainly have that and bring that and that emphasis I think would be, would be different. Uh, I think, uh, you know, our votes might be similar in a lot of issues. I think my approach on how to um, speak out on those and, and create more of a conversation about it as opposed to being quietly behind the scenes. Uh, on some issues, I would be much more vocal. I think people know that about me, whether it's um, about gun violence prevention or gay marriage, which I've talked about for you know 15 plus years, or certainly reproductive rights and women's, uh, and women's uh, equality. Um, environmental issues, uh, you know, uh, much more in a in, in front of the uh, conversation. Um, you know, there, there, uh, I was, um, one issue that came up was, was the Iran deal uh, and, and dealing with, with Israel, and I was, and still am, very skeptical about the deal. I was uh, not uh, quickly saying that I'm for it, and I think a lot of members of the House, especially on the Democratic side with a Jewish faith background, of which I also have, has had um, very so big concerns. So you would concerns. have voted against the president. You know, I, I, um, I think the issue is, you know, once 2017 comes on and making sure that the deal is being upheld and there's still even questions now of whether Iran is even um, adhering to the deal and keeping, keeping them uh, accountable. Um, the, the rhetoric that has happened between U.S. relations with Israel, I think, has also been um, terrible and created uh, we need to really uh, build those bridges and especially have people on the Democratic side help build those bridges because unfortunately it becomes such a partisan issue and it shouldn't be. You know, this is a strong ally for us in, in the Middle East and, and we need to, you know, mend those, mend those fences a bit. And, and just looking, uh, bringing it back locally a little bit, you've been on the council 12 years and your second term as mayor. Uh, we had a big significant change uh, with district elections mm -hmm. this year and I know you were, uh, um, you know, at Jason Dominguez's victory party, um, didn't get behind anybody formally in the race. Um, what do you think of district elections and how did it turn out from your perspective this year? Um, you know, I, I, we can't really tell yet. Uh, you know, uh, council member elect Dominguez has not started, uh, you know, and, and still we have other members on the council who haven't been elected that way. It'll be interesting to see how Kathy Murillo and Randy Rouse do their job now that they've been reelected under the district system. You're sort of getting a sense of these are my folks and really they're all city folks. Uh, we have district elections. I mean, that's, you know, the rule that we have. Um, I think, uh, uh, it's going to be my job as mayor to try to help, you know, look at the big picture and try to say, okay, maybe we're looking at districts and things are going to focus on six different areas of the city, but we're all one big city and we all have common goals and we all, and you still need four votes, sometimes five to get anything accomplished. And so how are we going to work together on making sure that uh, that occurs, that we don't just get into little fights here and there based on, you know, 
one part of the city over the other. I don't think that's where people are going to go. I hope not. Um, but I do think being mayor and having been mayor now for a term and a half and working with a very politically diverse council, being able to get things done oftentimes with a 7-0 vote, um, now I can bring that approach to this district process as well. This, this past year we also um, heard from Chief Cam Sanchez. He's, he's plans to retire. Uh, kind of a controversial figure. Uh, he, he was given uh, monthly reports to the council, to you. Uh, how would you assess Cam Sanchez's time in yes. the city? And what, do you, what are you looking for with uh, this new police chief recruitment? Right. Um, well, and as a reminder, I'm, I'm the one that pushed forward to have the police chief give regular updates to the council, and that was important for transparency and a way to have people ask questions. And I'm glad that that has worked out and, and kept going. You know, uh, and Chief Sanchez says it himself, it's unusual for someone to be a chief at a city for as long as he has. And um, so people are used to having a little more uh, change here and there. Um, you know, I think he, um, he brings, he brought a lot to the city in one capacity in terms of restorative policing. Uh, and that's dealing with mentally ill people on the streets who are homeless and uh, training law enforcement on how to recognize mental illness, how to address it and help coordinate whatever it takes to get people off the street and into supportive housing. Always a struggle working with the lack of affordable housing and also really lack of funding in the mental health side that we don't control. And so that's always been a constant struggle. But I have to say, you know, we have law enforcement agencies from throughout the state and other cities even outside California come here to learn about the restorative policing process. And so I give him a lot of credit uh, for that. You know, he... Um, you know, he, he has a way of sometimes uh, saying things in a big, bold way, and sometimes that works well, and sometimes it backfires. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do appreciate his candor, though. I, I think he, you know, whenever I've had to ask him a question, and he's, he's direct, and that's why we thought it was good to have those um, reports come back to yeah. the council. Let me, uh, we got about one minute left, and so real quickly I want to ask you about this Airbnb thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the council adopted what's basically the most stringent anti-Airbnb um, uh, legislation in the country. Uh, feel like you're kind of standing in the way of history here in terms of uh, whether shared economy or the gig economy right. or whatever you call it is? Well, I, I have actually said, and I've said this multiple times publicly, that I think there is a way you can do home sharing. We need to get a good proposal from the folks involved to make that work, and you need five votes to get it. Uh, I think there's been some, we do have an issue on affordable housing and rental rates and uh, in, in the marketplace, that's an issue. Um, I hope that we can find a happy medium there, but they're going to need to come to us with some proposal yeah. to make it work. All right. Helene Schneider, thank you so much for coming to see us. We could go on for uh, a, a while with this, and, and I hope you come back. Um, Josh Molina, thank you, and thank you all for watching, uh, newsmakers, and uh, have a happy holiday, and in your... Uh, End of year nonprofit gift giving. Please remember TV Santa Barbara. Good night.